All right, so football is where we start this exciting Tuesday edition of the Sports Max Zone. The rare nephew Jamaica Premier League playoffs got off to a banging start Monday night as four of the most prestigious clubs in the competition's history played two pulsating quarterfinal first leg games. Well, Tivoli Gardens had to come from behind to secure a 1-0 draw versus Waterhouse, while Annette Gardens also had to dig deep and equalize late versus Portmore United, as their match also finished 1-0 in the second doubleheader at Sabina Park. Well, all four coaches on the day felt there is all to play for come the second legs next Monday. We're still learning and you know we, can, we still can get better and have an excellent to go out there and play again. Well what I've seen with the Waterhouse team is, is my duty now to you know go and analyze and target what needs to be done and see how best we can win this game. Okay. It's gonna be tough next week again, but um, both teams are gonna prepare and um, hopefully the fans will entertain tonight. It's 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 a playoff, I mean it's uh, one all all to play for in the second half, so we definitely have to put aside our pain and our focus on the job that needs to be done. All right, so covering the matches at the ground was our very own Sportsmax analyst, Leger Williams, and he joins us this afternoon on set. Welcome, Leger. How was yesterday? Because when I was driving out of here, a lot of commotion at Sabina Park. As a matter of fact, I was in traffic for a while. Yeah, well, I think next time you need to make a call and make them give you the superstar entrance because yeah. you probably wouldn't have gone through that. I know Sir Lance was in no traffic yesterday. <laughs> but thankfully, I was at the, the venue pretty early, so I, I didn't encounter any, any issues with that. But it was a really good experience. I think both of the games were extremely competitive. Um, I will go on to analyse both of the games, but I was really impressed by not only the quality of football, but also the, the crowd that came out. Right. It made a really good atmosphere. And yeah, it's the JPL up and up. Yeah, good to hear the turnout was, of course, very encouraging because last week, Friday, we had our CEO, uh, Owen Hill, talking about all the different activations that would be present. So I think the viewers, of course, were intrigued and they showed up. So that aside, let's start by talking about the Waterhouse Civilly Gardens. I think that match was um, a match of two halves because Waterhouse, of course, dominant in the first half and then Tivoli getting back in the game in the second half. But I'd love to hear your assessment. Yeah, you're spot on, Mary. I, I do think that that game was, as you said, a game of two halves. Um, Waterhouse, in terms of their first half play, I think it was a similar... Both of the games went in, in, in similar ways. I think for the first half of the first game, Waterhouse, they, they, they did really well. They changed up what they usually do. I've been constant on this show complaining about how Waterhouse don't tend to use with enough. And I think even without Andre Fletcher, one of their more dominant wingers, 11 goals in the league, Leonardo Gibson coming in for him, I think that Waterhouse did an excellent job in terms of moving the ball centrally initially to then create space for the wide players in that first half. Their press was pretty good as well, not too high, but didn't sit off Tival either, allow them space only in their defensive third. So I think Waterhouse did an excellent job in that first half and they, it was a mistake that granted them the penalty to take the lead, but I think they were well worth the lead and Marcel Gale and his staff did an excellent job in that first half, but then we saw the, the, the scope of talent of coaching that Jerome Waite has, and he did a, made an excellent you know, adjustment at halftime, you know, taking off Nathan Thomas, who was at fault for giving away that penalty, who is a dedicated six, a dedicated holding midfielder, putting on Trevon McCain, who is an attacking midfielder and changing how Tivoli Gardens built up, how they decided to attack by putting on another creative midfielder alongside Howard Morris in McCain. And, I think that created another player for Tivoli to receive in between the lines, which then in terms would collapse that Waterhouse defence and create space out wide. And Tivoli just sustained pressure for so much of the game. And they got a bit lucky with their equaliser as well, but they created chance after chance. And I think Tivoli may feel a little bit unfortunate, albeit that they should have maybe conceded more than one in the first half to not walk away with a victory in the end. Yeah, I want to spend some time talking about that Waterhouse main man, Javain Bryan. He has been excellent for his team this season. Of course, in this match, he notched up his 15th goal of the season. Liz, you've been seeing the action up close and personal. Your views on how Javain has gone about his business this season? Yeah, I think he's been excellent considering that this is his first season in the Jamaica Premier League. Uh, he, he was playing, you know, tier two football before. 
always going out and getting his trials and didn't get the opportunity but it just goes to show that there is talent out there and it's not only that he's performing in the Jamaica Premier League, he's performing for a contending team as well, leading that line, as you mentioned, 15 goals, and he has a much more polished overall game. I think that a lot of people give him credit for Javain Bryan, and he was heavily involved yesterday, running the channels, yeah. pressing really well as well, and he eventually won that penalty, took that penalty, gave Waterhouse the lead, and he's a player that you can't really keep out of the game for too long. He's going yeah. to find a way to get involved, and he did yesterday, and... I think he did really well for Waterhouse. Yeah, and the player that got involved and got his name on the score sheet for Tivoli Gardens was Lennox Russell. You saw that one come in? Yeah, well, you know, before the game, it, it didn't get to get aired because of a bit of time constraints, but um, people who were watching the broadcast as opposed to being at the game yesterday would have, would have seen our, our new feature, Keys to the Game, which we introduced um, pre both of the games. And But for the Tivoli one that wasn't aired, I added it in my game notes. I know people are going to say maybe I'm making this up now that the game has passed, but something that I said that would be a key for Tivoli Gardens coming into this game would be their use of substitutes because we've seen how Jerome Waite has used his squad in a multitude of ways to get results throughout this season so far. We've seen Horatia Morgan come off of the bench and score a brace to win a game for Tivoli. We've seen Steve Clark come off of the bench and score a brace and win a game for Tivoli. And Lennox Russell has been one of those impact players as well. So I had no doubt that one of those substitutes would, have, would, have, would make an excellent impact for Tivoli. And I think it was all of their substitutes that made all of the change for Tivoli. I mentioned McCain who came in and added a bit of flair and creativ creativity in terms of his passing and movement from midfield. Radika Wellington came on as well and should have probably scored another goal with his chance. And he created the goal for um, the substitute who's... Uh, Lennox Russell, yes. yeah, he created that goal as well. So I, I do think that Tivoli often make those changes and they often work out really well. And yeah, you have to give all the credit to Jerome Waite in that instance. Yeah. Uh, Lish, can you talk us through that, that, that Tivoli equaliser though? Because um, the free kick itself was heading for goal. It was a brilliant stop. But the, the, the rebound ended up you know, falling in, 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 in Lennox Russell's lap. But talk us through this this free kick and do you think it was intended for goal initially? I think he was just trying to put it in a dangerous area. Dika yes. Wellington, he's a very talented set piece taker, but just judging by the velocity yes. of the initial free kick, I doubt that he was going for a direct strike. I think he was just trying to put it in behind that Waterhouse um, defensive line and it ended up, the bounce, I think that's what made it really difficult for Kemar Foster in that Waterhouse net. And I, I, I do think that it was a difficult delivery to deal with. I, I, I think he still should have done better, but it was a very good delivery by Radika Wellington, and that's something that has really been his bread and butter since coming into the league. Yeah, uh, of course, Russell was uh, a part of the last Arnett Gardens team that won the Premier League back in 2017, coached by uh, Jerome Waite. So Waite does have a couple of ex Arnett players in his Tivoli setup at the moment, and they appear to be working well for him. Yeah, he, early in the season, you know, halfway through, I was speaking to him uh, off air, and he was saying that. He has some surprises up his sleeve and he, he knows his players and he knows how to get the best out of them. Steve Clark is one of another player that has been out of football for some time and in the end, it, it, it's a player like that that's come on. Steve Clark has scored four goals this season for him. He's, and people were saying, no, oh, Steve Clark is an older player. He's been in the league so long. What sort of impact will he have? He missed the game yesterday, but I think he has been pivotal in getting some points for um, um, Tivoli Gardens this season. And, you know, Jerome Waits is, is very adamant that he knows his players and he knows how to get the best out of them. And he's been proven right definitely so far this season. Yeah, and of course, the second leg will be played next week, Monday. So we're expecting, um, of course, one of the teams to walk away with a win. Yeah, it's, it's, going, <laughs> it's going to be a, a really close battle again, I think. I, I, I'm still maintaining that Tivoli are a better team than Waterhouse, but okay. judging by the fact that Waterhouse definitely... The, the, their game plan, I think, was especially from the start, the first 45 minutes, was superior to Tivoli's. I think both managers went out and they, they, they were obviously watching film. They were obviously doing a lot of research. And I think the game plan of Waterhouse, not only offensively, offensively but defensively as well, I think their game plan was superior initially. Jerome Wade made his adjustments and ended up getting parity. But I do think that this Waterhouse team is still incredibly dangerous. They have goal scorers. If Andre Fletcher were to come back into the team, for example, Waterhouse have scored 39 goals this season. 
and their front three of Rivaldo Mitchell, Javain Bryan, and Andre Fletcher has now scored 31 of those. That's about as lethal as they can get as a front three. So I do think that that can cause problems for any team. And Tivoli, they, they can cause problems for them. We've seen that already. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how Tivoli deal with that threat. But I still do think that Tivoli will get through this one. Yeah, we're going to move along to the next fixture. And this, of course, was no short of excitement. It was also a riveting match. We had Annette earning themselves a late draw against Portmore. Walk us through the storyline. Yeah, you know, these two teams played each other in match week 25. It also was a one-all draw. Um, the the, the, the scoreline may be the same. It also may be the same that Portmore scored first and Arnett got back into it. But I do think that these were two completely different games. I think in the game in match week 25, Portmore were playing at a much slower tempo. I think in this game, Portmore surprised a lot of people. I think similarly to how Waterhouse came out, they were pressing much more aggressively. They were playing at a really quick tempo. Their leading goal scorer, Siobhan Walsh, was out of the starting lineup that paved the way for Gio Headley to come into the squad and he added some pace and thrust up front. I do think this Portmore team were deserved, deserved leaders. And I think, I, I've said before that this Arnett team, they're a very young team. So as you can see with a lot of young teams, if you, if you want to look across Europe, if you want to look across just football generally, when a young team is playing another team, it's very they're very, they become very dependent on what the other team is doing and react to that. So if Portmore are playing at a slow tempo, Arnett Gardens will react to that and then play themselves into a lull. But I think they didn't expect Portmore to play at a quicker tempo and it caught them a bit off guard and they were on their heels, I think, in that first half. But adjustments were made and there's a very important point I'd like to make about central progression. And I've mentioned it on the show before. Central progression is exactly what it sounds like. It's getting the ball through the middle of the pitch. And that is the most dangerous way to create chances because when you progress the ball centrally, you open up the middle of the field and the wings as well. If you're a talented enough team to progress the ball centrally, you will be able to infiltrate teams all across the field as opposed to if you just want to go down the wing, you're forced to you know, play on the wing and the touchline is an extra defender there. So if you're progressing the ball centrally, that's what all successful teams do. Arnett Gardens, Xavier Gilbert hinted at the fact that that was their game plan going into the game. In the first half, they didn't do it well, made their changes and in the second half, we saw their wingers come up much narrower and they started to cause Arnett Gardens a lot of problem and if you can even see their goal here, that is what it came from. Their attackers coming extremely narrow, creating the space for Philander Wing, who scored the own goal earlier, to get a simple cross because he had all that space to equalize for Arnett Garden. So it was a very interesting tactical game, yeah. a game of two halves again. Mm -hmm. uh, both of the games, I think, were extremely interesting from multiple facets. So I, I think the JPL is, is going on pretty good right now, and I'm very pleased to be you know, watching on. Yeah, and you know, you speak about uh, Annette and Kahim Dixon in the 20th minute. He had a close chance, you saw that one. Yeah, of course, you know, I was, <laughs> I was pitch side, you know, Maria, I saw that one um, close and for I think he didn't choose the right finish. I'm not sure if we have the, the highlight here, but he didn't choose the right finish, decided to go a, a bit high. He was on the right hand side, had the, the angle to go across the goalkeeper and instead tries to go for that near post high finish. I think that was the wrong finish and that could have changed the game as well. I think he would have given this young Arnett team a lot of confidence. So, yeah, that, that was a big chance for Kaim Dixon, which he didn't take. Yeah, I saw the pictures of the Portmore coach, Philip Williams, after the Arnett Garns equaliser. He looked shattered because he had had the lead for such a long time and um, he looked really disappointed just looking at his body language. But the writing was on the wall because Arnett were spending a lot of time in Portmore's defensive third before they actually got the equaliser. Yeah, that, that's a, another danger that I was speaking of when you allow a team to progress the ball centrally. Because if, you're, if a team is successfully progressing the ball centrally, you as a defensive team have to react. You have to collapse the space. And if you're collapsing the space centrally because you don't want any team cutting through the middle of you, you're going to allow space on the wings. And if you allow space on the wings and the team that is progressing the ball centrally has the quality to keep the ball in those central areas, then you're allowing that team to sustain pressure on you and really and truly Portmore couldn't get out, I think, until they subbed on Siobhan Walsh, which was a, he's a unit, he can hold up the ball really well. 
and that's the only time Port Moray got any life towards the end of the game. But I think for majority of the second half, Arne Gans were much the better team. And it's because of those tactical changes that Xavier Gilbert made. Was there a fitness issue about Walsh why he didn't start? That, that, that's what I was hearing. Um, the team manager said before the game that they're a team. Um, he warmed up with the, the, the first team, yes. but it, it, it is seen because he was coming off of a couple of injuries yeah. towards the end of the season, so uh -huh. it did seem as if there was a fitness issue. But yeah. if he is in the squad, I was saying it to Chris Taylor yesterday as well, we saw it in the Link Cup last season, the All Island knockout which Portmore won. He is a player and a striker that I think is one of those players that can win a team, a title, yes. just by off of the strength of his quality. I agree with you, which is why I asked the question. I want to go back to the clip that we just saw where there was a cross to um, Fabian Reed. He opted not to head directly on goal, but take it on the chest and then uh, try the shot. Um, a, a, a moment of indecision because I thought a headed effort there would have given him a better chance to score. Yeah, I think so as well. I think he probably just saw the maybe amount, the amount of time he had tried to yes. weigh up his options. I don't think it was the right decision as well, which is very rare for Fabian Reed. But he ended up, you know, getting his goal. He's a striker that he, he, he doesn't necessarily need 100 chances to score, but sometimes he'll miss two or three and then always pop up. Mm. So that, that's not a, a worry of mine. It was a moment of indecision, I think. I just think that he probably saw that he had a yeah. lot of space and yeah. chose to another option. And as you said, he did get the equalising goal in the end. Yeah. He was Arnett Garn's leading scorer back in 2017 when they last won the title. And uh, credit to this 32-year-old that he still has the potency to be leading Arnett's scoring line. So... Um, best of luck to Arnett as they try to fend off the Sportmore team, the <laughs> most successful team in the history of the Jamaica Premier League. But it's going to be, I agree with you, I think the return semifinals, quarterfinals next week will be very hot. I'm not sure who will win both of them. <laughs> At the moment, they are tied, both of them, and um, four really good teams. Yeah. I, I agree with you that I give Tivoli the edge, but I don't know what to say about the Portmore Arnett one. I'm, I'm not quite sure either because we saw Portmore hasn't lost to Arnett this season. Yeah. And as I said, a lot of time, I think. Portmore, Arnett allows Portmore too often to dictate the game states. Right. And yes, it's dependent on the fact that Portmore has been has scored first in all of all three of those games. But I do think if Arnett comes on and tries to be much more aggressive from the jump, yeah. they'll have a much better chance against Portmore than previously. All right, Lejwal, what's for sure is we're not short of excitement where the JPL is concerned. And next week, Monday, Lej. We have to see how these results turn out and then you'll join us back on set. Yeah, of course, and I'll be at the game as well if anyone wants to stop and say hi. Just I shout out from the crowd, I, I'll, I'll hear. I think not. <laughs> he, he's not what he looks like on the zone. He's, he's very different. It's break time. <laughs>